false pretenses from a government agency, and I'd like you to identify yourself now. Save yourself some embarrassment. So stand up, no harm done, but just let everybody know. Come on. Ah, this is very interesting, because once again I was watching the audience, and some of you were looking around to see who the person was. Those of you who weren't looking around are suspect. <laughs> but nobody stood up. I, uh, I first uh, tried that coup when I was at a, uh, a rather, uh, rather sketchy, rather iffy tax haven conference in the Cayman Islands some years ago. And I actually said that, and not one, but two people stood up. <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm not kidding you. And I've, I've used it occasionally since then. But uh, government agents usually do have to identify themselves. So I'm, I'm gratified to see it, but I'm disappointed in the uh, Black Riders of Mordor. So what I want to do uh, is tell you how I became a libertarian, partially. Uh, I want to tell you where I think the society is going to go over the next few years and uh, maybe tomorrow I'll tell you what I think you ought to do about it but let me just start out uh, I'll tell you I'll tell you my uh, political pilgrims progress I remember I remember this very distinctly when you look back into your early childhood and see what you can remember and what you can't remember one of the first things that I can remember was when I was about seven years old. And I grew up uh, in Chicago. And uh, for some reason, my mother took me someplace in Chicago through a, a bad area. A lot, of, a lot of black people living in slums. And being a suburban kid, I was kind of shocked. I thought it was terrible that these people were, were living in dumps. And you know what I said to my mother? I said, this isn't right. I'm a seven-year-old kid. I was a precocious seven-year-old kid. But I said, isn't there something that you can do, uh, do about it? And she didn't quite say, well, write your congressman. But uh, I got the idea that I ought to write a letter to President Eisenhower. And my mother took down what I said, and she typed it up, and she sent a letter to Eisenhower. And I knew even then, at seven years old, that there was something wrong with what I asked her to do. But she did it. Now, I don't have any political memory from there until I'm in high school. In between there, that time, when I was seven, and wrote a letter to Eisenhower, and when I was in high school, I don't remember much about my political evolution. I, I only know that I never liked authority. And I always felt when somebody asked me, hey, you got a problem with authority, my answer would always be something like, no. I just don't like people telling me what to do. And that's, that's about the extent of my evolution at that, at that point. But it, it went beyond that. The first thing that really happened to me was when I was in high school, and I read Barry Goldwater's book, Conscience of a Conservative. A lot of the things in there made sense, and I figured I must be a conservative. And then my next step after that was... After I got out of college, for the last year I was in college, I read Ayn Rand's Virtue of Selfishness. And I remember that clearly. It's one of those maybe dozen things in my intellectual development that are burned like a diamond in my forehead. I read the first book, of the, of the first page of a Virtue of Selfishness, and I had to put it down. I said, I can't believe somebody has actually crystallized everything that I've always intuitively believed, but had not been able to formulate. So at that point, shamefully, I became a Randite, uh, because it made so much sense. But then, the next evolution was when I was in my 20s, and I went on a treasure hunting expedition, uh, a real one, with a big boat and everything, for three months. And one of the books I brought along with me was a book called The Market for Liberty. It's written by the Tannehills, mostly Morris, I guess. And uh, 
Uh, it was a defense of anarchism, but never once in that book did they use the word anarchy, which is one reason why it was probably such an effective defense. It explained how an anarchic society would work. But here's an interesting thing. Only 500 copies of that book were printed. It was like a samizdat. But later on, the, the boat sank and my book went down with it and so forth. But then, in 1979, I wrote a book called Crisis Investing. And it was number one on the New York Times list for 19 weeks. And I did all these television shows and so forth. And so, I think it was Andrea Rich got in touch with me because I'd been promoting the book in the, in the bibliography of my book and I got hundreds of calls and letters. Where can I get this book, Market for Liberty? And uh, so they asked me to write the foreword for the book and they asked Carl Hess, uh, who many of you probably know who he is, to write the introduction for it. So it was kind of like a back to the future kind of thing where I got to write a foreword for the book that changed my life, which is kind of not usually the way it works. But that wasn't good enough to become an anarchist, in my opinion. My next step was to become a Discordian. And a lot of you here will know what a Discordian is. Uh, I can sum up Discordian philosophy for you very briefly. And it's this. The whole of the law shall be do as thou wilt. But be prepared to accept the consequences. So that's where I am. I've taken a step from growing up in a cannibalistic death cult, Catholicism, <laughs> to thinking I was a conservative and then thinking I was a Randite and even anarchism isn't good enough. So that's where I am right now. It's a funny thing though, because I met Anne Rand uh, just a few months before she died, actually, I was invited to a party uh, <clears throat> where she was the featured, um, she was the guest of honor, obviously. And uh, I found her charming, warm, very much unlike uh, the way I guess she really is, or was. <laughs> uh, but after, after the party, I went out with about a dozen of her acolytes, and uh, it turned into a uh, it turned into a real clusterfuck because uh, I was already a Discordian and these people were clearly co-religionists where anything that, was, that Rand said was dogma. So we didn't get along very well and it's very interesting about the Randites. It's that uh, it really is a secular religion, much like Marxism. It's funny, I was on a a radio show with some guy named Yaron Brook. I remember his name because, once again, I don't argue with people. It's pointless to have arguments with people. You present your point of view and you listen to the other persons and you respond to it. That's all I was doing. But this guy who runs the Ayn Rand Institute or something like that, he just went wild. And he, it's like he became a lifelong enemy of mine because I was like a heretic, which is further proof that that's just a religion. Anyway, the, uh, that kind of leads me to talking about uh, philosophy, and I, I know this is Stefan's big thing, but to me, talking about philosophy is a little bit pointless. Nobody really cares about philosophy in general, but they do care about the two areas of practical and applied philosophy. Now, what might those be? Well, they're the two things you're never supposed to talk about in public. Religion and politics. That's, those are the practical and applied areas of philosophy. So people talk about philosophy in general, but they'll never talk about philosophy in particular. I, when I'm in the U.S., which is less and less these days, I generally live in Aspen, Colorado, which is a very interesting subculture of a town. And I used to get invited to parties there. I never get invited to parties there anymore because after talking about the weather and the state of the roads and baseball scores, that's good for five minutes. Now what are you going to talk about? Well, I like to talk about important things. I like to talk about philosophy, practical applied philosophy. What is that? That's religion and politics, the two things you're never supposed to talk about in polite company. So. This is why I'm rapidly becoming an ex-aspinite at this point, because I can't talk to anybody there. It's one of the nice things about 
groups like this. So, politics. Uh, I first, it first started seeping into my brain that it was pointless trying to make any political changes in this country when in 1980, when my second book, Crisis Investing, was number one on the list. And of course, in those days, some of you will remember, Phil Donahue's show was as big or bigger than Oprah was until recently. So I had the singular good luck to be on Donahue's show all by myself for an hour the day before the national elections when Carter and Reagan were running against each other. So Phil's a very smart guy. And we were talking, and the elections were the very next day, and this was live. And so he, uh, I said something unkind about Carter and whatever, and he said, oh, then you're voting for Mr. Reagan. And I said something even more unkind about Reagan, because re Republicans are more dangerous than the Democrats. They're more dangerous because they, on the surface, sound like free market people. Well, they're not, of course. Uh, they definitely don't believe in social freedom, and they say they believe in, in economic freedom, which gives people, turns people off. Well, at least the Democrats, I've got to say, at least they're, they actually do have a core philosophy, and they actually do believe in collectivism. The Republicans do too. They just don't, they aren't honest enough to come out and say it. They're hypocrites. I hate hypocrites. Anyway, so after I said something unkind about Reagan, Phil said, ah, then you must be a libertarian. You're voting for whoever the libertarian candidate was. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. In 1980. And at that point, the audience, like the mob they were, were going back and forth, liking what I said, hating it, back and forth. They really disliked it when I told them, even back then, that it's the worst allocation of time and money you can possibly make sending your kids to be corrupted by going off to college. They really didn't like that. But I'll tell you what they liked even less. They liked even less when I gave them, I started to give them the five reasons why I wasn't voting for the Libertarian the next day and why, they, why the mob shouldn't vote at all. So there are, the eyes of the audience widened on me. I could see this because I was watching them. And um, I started to give them the five reasons you shouldn't vote. I started out with saying, first, it's immoral because the whole political system is corrupt it's based upon force and coercion, and it's immoral for you to participate in it. Well, no reaction really, because they're not used to hearing the word morality used from somebody that's not wearing a, a black suit with one of those little collars. Then I got to the second point that I was going to make. It's that it just gets your name into another government computer bank. They, you're identifying yourself further to the government. The third reason I gave them was that it just encourages them. Nobody with any sense is actually voting for one of these jerks. They're voting against the other guy. But the guy they wind up voting for thinks it's actually a vote for him. So it just encourages them, and it keeps the system going. The audience is getting restive. I got to the fourth reason, was it's degrading to you as a human being to stand around a government office to identify yourself, to vote, to hang around the kind of people that do this type of thing. And I could not get to the fifth and most important reason that you shouldn't vote, which is your vote doesn't count. It counts about as much as a grain of sand on the beach. And I didn't even get from there to saying, anyway, it's not who votes that counts. It's like Stalin correctly uh, observed. It's who counts the votes. And this was in Chicago, where Donahue did that. They could have understood that. <laughs> so, anyway, this kind of led me to the psychology of Bubis Americanus, to the, the unwashed mob out there. I mean, I remember one guy in this audience when I was making a, on the Donahue show, when I was making a comment about taxes and theft and all this type of thing, some observation, and I swear this is the truth. You can find the tape. I don't even have the tape of it anymore. It's too bad because it was one of my best performances ever. And I said, and the guy says, raises his hand, and he says, well, why doesn't the government pay for these things? I mean, that is the level of thinking politically. So 
trying to change things in this country is totally impossible. If somebody can ask a question like that, why doesn't the government pay for it? When I said taxpayers are paying for it, uh, it's, it's completely pointless. It's a complete waste of time, and you're kidding yourself looking for political change. But this kind of led me over the years to think about the psychology of the average chimpanzee out there. And I'm a believer in the fact that Pareto's law is a correct analysis of uh, reality. Now you all know Pareto's law, it's the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of your salesmen make 80% of the sales. 20% of the population commits 80% of the crimes. It's a normal bell-shaped curve. And I've come to the conclusion that libertarianism, God forbid anarchism, uh, God forbid discordianism, is actually a genetic mutation. And it's very hard to change a genetic mutation. It is part of your being. This is not to say that it's a waste of time to try to explain. Don't try to convince. That's pointless. Then you get into an argument with people. And when you're in an argument with people, they feel like they've got to win. So you're not going to get anywhere. The most that I do is say something and let those who have ears hear, as it were. But um, getting back to Pareto's law, my interpretation of one aspect of it is that 80% of human beings are basically decent, social, get-along, go-along, people of goodwill. I'd say 80% according to Pareto's law. What about the other 20%? That other 20% are what you might call potential trouble sources. They can blow either way in the wind, depending on how they read the situation. They're kind of amoral, not immoral. The real problem, that's bad, but the real problem is when you get down to the 20% of that 20%, now you're dealing with people with criminal personalities, people that are basically of bad will, and you can take it further, 20% of the 20% of the 20%. Now, here's the problem that we're confronting right now in the U.S. It's that those of you who are, you're all libertarians, you're all anarchists, we're on the other side of that bell-shaped curve, the other 20% on the other side, tiny little, little tail on the other side, opposite from these people. But here's the problem. All systems, I don't care what system you're looking at, I don't care what organization or company or whatever group you're looking at, they all degrade over time. They all lose their focus. They all go downhill. It's, it's the second law of thermodynamics. It's entropy. It's just the way things work. Uh, it's why emperor, empires rise and they always fall. Now, here's the problem that we're confronting right now in this country, and I'm afraid in the world as a whole, because this is happening all over the world. It's not just here in the U.S. The problem is this. People, actually, the state is in the ascendant all over the world, but especially here in the United States. Everybody is thinking politically. Everybody is thinking the government should do this, the government should do that, the government should change things. Everybody, even people basically that are in the 80% of goodwill, decent human beings. So the state, both from a, a psychological point of view, has insinuated itself throughout the entire society. It's the centerpiece of society. And what is this doing? And, and, and of course, in the laws, and most people believe they should obey the law. I, I mean, to me, most laws are frauds. Uh, there are only two laws, as far as I'm concerned. Do all that you say that you're going to do, and don't aggress against other people or their property. That's the whole of the law. I can live with the law like that. But the solution is to pass more laws, and that's exactly what these sociopaths are doing. Now, why is it going to get worse from here? If you trace the history of the United States, it started going downhill right from the founding thought.
the first thing they did in the 1790s, first important law they passed, was the Alien and Sedition Acts. That was overturned. But then you watch the history of the U.S. It was a, it was a model to the world. Instantly, America is not a place. America is an idea. Keep that in your mind. It's not a piece of geography. It's an idea. And it was unique in the world's history, actually. But it started going downhill with wars, the Civil War, World War I, foreign adventures. And it's like anything that goes downhill. It starts slowly, gets faster and faster and faster, and it's just like, an, it's like a gigantic snowball rolling down a hill. After it reaches a certain point, you cannot stop it. There's too much momentum, there's too much mass. In it. And that's exactly where we are today. So where is this all going to end? It's going to end with the snowball of statism and collectivism smashing into the village at the bottom of the valley and destroying the whole damn thing. And then it's going to reorient. Now, I don't know how it's going to reorient, but I can give you some thoughts. It's like a good example would be the French Revolution in 1789. The French Revolution was an excellent thing. Uh, Louis XIV, not Louis says rather, it was great to get rid of them. Fantastic to get rid of the old regime. But what did they get after that? Then they got Robespierre and the Directorate, and then they got Napoleon. The same thing is going to happen here. I think it's almost inevitable. So it's very bad. And I'll give you a reason, another reason. It's not just momentum that's driving the country this way at an accelerating pace. It's the fact that there are basically two types of people in the world. Well, there's lots of ways of dividing people in two classes, but let me give you the one that's relevant now. There are people, because there are two ways you can deal with your, your fellow human beings, or chimpanzees, if you prefer. One is you have people that believe you should deal with other people voluntarily, without using violence, without using force. That's one type. The other type is a person that believes that you should deal with people, or you have to deal with people, or some people, coercively and by force. Now, guess which type are inevitably attracted to government? It's the worst criminal types of personalities. It's always those people that believe you should deal with other people by force, that are attracted to government because the government is congealed force. I mean, as Mao said, the power of the state comes out of a barrel of a gun. So those people like the government. They're attracted to it. They like to go to work for it and they like to use it. It's part of their psychological makeup. Now, here's the problem. If you started a government, you'd have a normal distribution of personality types. 80% good, 20%, eh, 4%, like as I said before. The problem is this, is that as the system degrades, the second law of thermodynamics works with people too, I think, eventually the criminal personalities start making the decent human beings who wound up in the government maybe because they needed a job or maybe because they actually they're just mistaken and they think it can do some good, it starts edging them out and making them feel uncomfortable. So eventually, it gets taken over by the sociopaths. And history is just full of examples of that. Once they get a real control, like they did in Germany in the 30s, or in Russia in the 20s, forget about it. It ain't going to turn around. It ain't going to turn around until that snowball hits the village at the bottom of the hill. And that's exactly where we are right now, in my opinion. So, let's ask ourselves, so what's the government going to do if this is the trajectory that we're on? Well, to me, it's completely predictable. Uh, because even though America is a fantastic idea, it's just an idea. But right now, America has been purged from this geographical area here. It's still pretty nice, but things are happening right before your eyes, very rapidly. Now, economically speaking, we're just in the very early stages of what I call the Greater Depression. This is a period of time 
when the standard of living of most people drops significantly. And even by the government's own statistics, which I don't trust any more than I trust the statistics of the Argentine government, which is where I live most of the year, so I'm not reasonably familiar with, with criminality on a mass scale. Uh, even by their own statistics, the average guy is losing ground. Absolutely. Well, you've got two things that are propping it up. Number one is the average guy, stupid as he is in many ways, uh, let me define stupid. It doesn't necessarily mean low IQ, because the average IQ is 100, okay? <laughs> Obviously. Uh, I define stupidity as an unwitting tendency to self-destruction. That's a much more accurate and usable definition than low intelligence. So, what's happening is the average guy understands, he wants to improve his, his self, his, his, his he wants to improve his station in life, and he understands intuitively, even though he understands nothing about economics, he knows that you've got to produce more than you consume, and you've got to save the difference. That creates capital, and that's why the standard of living goes up. One other reason, that's one reason, very important, critical. Second reason is technology, okay? Those are the two reasons that are the mainsprings of why things get better in the material world, okay? Problem is this, is like that nincompoop uh, Mitt Romney said the other day, and he's denying he said it, of course, is that at this point, 47% of the people are net recipients of the government. They don't feel like they have to produce more than they consume. They don't presume like, they don't, they don't believe they have to create capital at this point. So that gets out of the bag. Uh, there's no way of turning it around at this point. It doesn't matter which one of these people win. I, I, I don't know and I don't care. That's funny that I say I don't know and I don't care. Because what are the two big problems in the U.S.? Well, lots of problems. But one of them is ignorance and the other is apathy. I don't know and I don't care. So I guess I'm no better than any of those other chimpanzees from that point of view. But... Uh, I think you can absolutely plan your lives around the fact that we're now involved and have been for the last five years in the Greater Depression. And we're just in the eye of the storm right now. This is going to be a hurricane that's going to be not just the biggest thing since the 1930s, this is going to be the biggest thing since the Industrial Revolution. It's going to be the biggest thing since the French Revolution. It's going to be unbelievably ugly. You got seven billion chimpanzees out there, and uh, they're going to be. This is a whole different speech. I don't want to go into that, but but I don't see I don't see any way around it now. There's even if even if I was elected president of the United States, there's absolutely nothing that could be done right now. If Ron Paul was elected president of the U.S., the first thing that would happen was he'd have a sit-down with the heads of the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, the DEA, and all these other Praetorian agencies, and maybe overtly, but definitely in an understandable way, they'd make it clear to them that things aren't going to change. So you can't turn this around. Well, not only the heads of these agencies and the, the government, the Supreme Court, if Ron Paul tried to turn things around if, through some miracle, and it would be a miracle, literally, literally he was in office, the Supreme Court would knock down the changes that he'd want to make, the Congress would pass new laws, and the people would riot. So you can forget about it. There's absolutely zero political hope. I, I'm not trying to be a pessimist, I'm just telling you this is the way the world works. So. What's all this going to, how's this all going to come unglued? Well, one of the reasons why, despite what I've just said about capital and savings and technology, one of the reasons why the U.S. has done as well as it has over the last 20, 30 years is because our major export has been dollars. It's been wonderful. We've shipped about 7 trillion U.S. dollars outside the U.S., and those nice Japanese send us Sonys and Toyotas, and the nice Germans send us Audis and Mercedes. That's a great trade. Come on. 
and it's propped up the standard of living in this country. But the problem is this. We've actually reached the point where these people are starting to look at each other and they realize that uh, this is like a this is like that game where the music stops. If you don't have a chair, you're screwed, okay? It's a shell game. So they're trying to get rid of these dollars. So there's going to be an absolutely catastrophic financial panic at some point in the next few years, I suspect, pretty soon. And what's going to happen to those dollars? Nobody outside the U.S., apart from custom and convenience, has to accept the U.S. dollar. The only place you have to accept the U.S. dollar is back in the U.S., so they're going to come back to the U.S. The dollars come back in, the title to companies and the wheat and the computers and the Boeings are going to go out. And this is, this is going to be a real problem, but it's absolutely inevitable that it's going to happen. Well, there's a lot more, because as you know, uh, for some years now, the government has been engaging in quantitative easing. And it's amazing how people use this term. They make up a word for currency debasement. And yet everybody uses it. Nobody says currency debasement. They all say QE, because that's the word they use. I, I mean, the, the level of intellectual degradation in this country is it, it's breathtaking. And they use these words with a straight face. So there's trillions more of these dollars being created. Right now, they're just sitting in banks. Banks don't want to lend, people don't want to borrow the balance, but dollars are sitting there. But as they create more of them, they're going to do something with them. They're going to come out in addition to the trillions of dollars from the U.S. coming in. So it's going to be a horrible monetary situation. So what's the government going to do about this? Well, they're doing it now. I don't know how many of you people are actually involved in the financial markets, but let me tell you something. Uh, if you go to almost any foreign country in the world today and you open up a bank account, which is much harder for anybody anywhere than it used to be. It used to be just give them the money and they give you an account. That's the way it used to be in this country and everywhere. It's not that way anymore. Once you identify yourself as a U.S. citizen or even a U.S. resident, and I speak from experience. I really know what I'm talking about here. I'm boots on the ground when it comes to this stuff. They'll show you the door. Well, maybe not. It's a large account, and if you fill out forms that declare it to the U.S. government and so forth, yes, maybe. But a lot of places, it's just not worth the trouble. So you can forget at this point about having a foreign bank account, even in Canada. You can't open an account in Canada. Uh, convenient, used to be easy, not e can't be done now. Forget about a brokerage account. Not a real brokerage account. They'll give you an account with a U.S. branch that they, they deal with. So that's happening. You've got to declare all your assets. Any financial account that you have, even if you open that account somehow, you have to declare it. And if you don't declare it, the penalties are draconian. You just don't want to deal with them. They are horrible. So it's very problematical. Early stages of capital controls. I promise you that as the situation gets out of control, Bubis Americanus is going to demand the government do something, do something. We're, we're losing all our, our, our money is being infl inflation. I can't buy food for prices I can afford. I can't, I can't afford the $125 it takes to fill up my pick -em up truck to drive two hours to work every day from a place I can afford to wherever my job is. So what are they going to do? Well, obviously it's the fault of those rich people that have been sending money out of the country and sheltering themselves in foreign bank accounts. So it's going to be go from hard to ship money out of this country to near impossible. So let me give you a piece of advice. And if you don't remember anything else that I say, remember this. You better do something. You better do something. You better do it now while it's still possible, even if hard and inconvenient, because it's going to be impossible and dangerous in the future. Absolutely plan your life around that. And if you haven't done anything about it and you don't do anything now, you're going to get what you deserve. Okay? And I'm sorry to say this to a group of anarchists, but this is just uh, practical advice. Oh, also, 
with the government running these gigantic deficits, which incidentally are not going to go down, they are going to go up for all kinds of reasons that I want to go into now, they're going to need an extra tax. Well, what kind of a tax? Oh, wait a minute. An asset tax, because that's only going to affect the rich people. There'll be an exemption of $500,000 a year. So the, the mob, which is to say 80%, 90% of the people in the country aren't going to be subject to it, at least not initially, just like the original income tax, there's going to be an asset tax. Half a percent, one percent, maybe two percent per year of all your assets. Okay? So what are you going to do about this? It's going to happen. It's, it's absolutely baked in the cake. So, oh, oh, of course the last thing. <laughs> How could I almost forget this? It's that when the going gets tough, the government, I mean, if you watch these pres vice presidential debates last night, I, I forced myself to do it. And I had to gag myself with a spoon after they were over. But uh, there's going to be another war. Absolutely. It's just, this is history repeating itself with a variation. It's like the 1930s, where if you looked around, you could see, yeah, yeah, there's going to be a war. And this is exactly the way it's building up right now. So the next real or imagined incident, there's going to be lots of new laws, lots of problems, and so forth. And let me tell you something. You people, and me too, are on the watch list. If you're uh, an enemy of the state, or suspected of just not pulling with everybody else, you're in a lot of trouble. You don't want to be here. You really don't. Your neighbors are going to squeal on you. You know, you walk into a Walmart now. What's the sign you see? See something, say something. And they do. So we're just in the early stages of all this stuff. This is just starting. We're in the eye of the hurricane. We went through the leading edge of the hurricane in 2008, 2009 print up a whole bunch of money, makes people feel better, we're in the eye of the storm. We are going to come out through the other end of the storm, and it's going to be vastly worse than it was back in those days, if you recall what it was like in 2008, 2009. Much worse, with lots more laws, lots of social problems, and a war. Why? Because it's not the government's fault, it's somebody else's fault. It's those damn Chinese for creating all that cheap stuff that people like that's in Walmart. It's their fault for unemploying our workers. It's those, it's those damned Arabs for charging too much for their oil. Who the hell knows? They'll come up with somebody I'm probably not even thinking of. And at that point, if you're not one of the chimpanzees that's pulling with all the others against the enemy, the new enemy group, you're in trouble. Why do you think H.L. Mencken dummied up during World War I and World War II both? He didn't want to get lynched. And the society in those days was much more stable and much more pro-freedom, economic and social, than it is today. Somebody tell me I'm wrong. I mean, where am, what am I missing? So, here's my advice. Here's what you should do. I think you should make as much money as you can, as quickly as you can. This is a problem that I've always had with libertarians, incidentally. Libertarians are intellectuals. They're like Karl Marx. And you know what Mrs. Marx said to Karl. This is apocryphal, but I'm sure it's true. She said, Karl, stop writing about capital and make some of it. <laughs> so I'm tired of seeing penniless libertarians that talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Okay? So. Get yourself a bunch of money, figure out some goods and services that you can provide to other people, grab the money and get the money out of the country, number one. Number two, if you don't want to get washed away in the flood, I suggest you make arrangements to get yourself out of the country too, or at least have a crib outside so if the going gets tough, as it always gets tough in every damn country in the world, this country has been so lucky that uh, nothing's happened so far. But it's gonna. So if you're not prepared, uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be big trouble. Especially, especially for you people who are not among the great masses that believe all the things they're told. You're, you'll be pinpointed as troublemakers. I know that I am. So 
I suggest you um, prepare on that. Make money, get it out of the country while it's still legal and possible. Okay, hard, but legal and possible. So this is practical advice. Uh, I'm supposed to talk tomorrow at this banquet dinner. You got to sing for your rubber chicken around here, so I'll do that again tomorrow. And I want to talk to you, if I can, about what I'm doing personally for my hobby. This has been a hobby of mine for 30 years. And I want to talk to you about my hobby. It's kind of amusing. It's kind of fun. I think, I th I think you'll like to hear it. Uh, so, I don't know. Those are just some general thoughts. I could probably ramble on as long as Fidel Castro, but who wants that? So, um, question or two? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Casey, I'm a 20-year-old female college student. How am I able to do anything about my monetary situation? I have no money. Is it possible for individuals like myself who literally have um, the means to do, uh, have no means to do anything, do something? Please educate me on how. Well, that's a good question. Um, you've got to produce a good or service that other people are willing to buy. Now, if you're completely unskilled, but good-looking female, you can... <laughs> But let's not, let's not go there. <laughs> Look, what you got to do is you, 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 the only thing that you take with you, absolutely the only thing you own are the skills in your hands and the knowledge in your mind. That's all you own. The rest of it, they can take away from you and they very well might. There are all kinds of people in all kinds of countries, just within the living memory of those of us here who've lost absolutely everything and they have to start all over again. Now you are luckier than most of them because you're young, you've got sound philosophical ideas, you're going to be in much better shape. But what you've got to do is arm yourself with specific marketable skills and knowledge. What's that mean? Well, you've got to learn stuff. Yeah, they don't mean the kind of bullshit you get by going to college. That's worthless. You've got to read a lot of books. You've got to become expert in not just one thing, but several things, or many things, because you don't know where you're going to land. It's a general answer. I'm not going to tell you plastics. <laughs> but that's what you've got to do. You've got to think entrepreneurially. You've got to stop thinking like an employee looking for a job, like all those other chimpanzees are, create jobs. What nonsense. So that's the answer. It's strictly psychological mindset. Totally. Plus armed with skills and knowledge. A lot of libertarians think there's going to be this big, dramatic collapse we're going to be able to go back to the Stone Ages. Um, what if it's not quite like that, Matt? Could it be something other than that? Yeah, sure. I hope it's not that kind of collapse because, you know, I regret to say that, you know, I'm 66 goddamn years old. And you know what happens? Like Maury Wills, the famous shortstop set, the legs are the first to go, so I can't run anymore. You know, <laughs> so... I'm not looking to go back to the Stone Age. I find it unpleasant and inconvenient. Uh, no, I don't think... I think anything is possible, of course, but even when the Roman Empire collapsed during the 400s, life went on. It just didn't go on so well for some people in some places. That's all. So I don't know. I can't predict the future. I can... I can give you a gloomy scenario from a dystopian sci-fi sci movie to all kinds of things in between. I'll tell you one thing that I really do believe is important. It's that I think that uh, you've got to think, I think Paul Rosenberg was talking about this a little bit earlier too. 
you got to uh, find ways to organize yourself. I'm a big believer in Neil Stevenson, the sci-fi writer's concept of files, P-H-Y-L-E-S, where birds of a feather flock together. Personally, I don't have any loyalty to the United States government. Screw them. I don't have any loyalty to my fellow Americans. That's just an accident of birth. And I don't believe you should be controlled by an accident of birth. I'll tell you who I'm loyal to. I'm more loyal to friends. Uh, friends that I have in the Congo than I am to the average American that lives five, mi five miles down the street from me in Aspen. Why? Because the people in the Congo, some of them, I'm talking about most of them, they're mostly chimpanzees just like the people in this country are. But the, the people that I know, we share the same outlook on the world, we share the things that are important, okay, a, a, a view of philosophy that's important. Uh, so I think that that's one of the good things about the internet, is that you can identify who your real countrymen are. And they can be from all over the world, all religions, although I'm an atheist, of course, but I overlook that with people that are of goodwill. Uh, people of all races, religions, geographies, whatever. You can find out who they are, and I think the way the world is going to organize itself is in these files, where that's where your loyalty is, that's where your defense mechanisms are, those are the people that you prefer to do business with. So this is kind of a little file, although it's pretty loosely wrapped. I think that's the way it's going to go. After the nation states collapse, and they are going to collapse, people like to be organized, people are basically social, so I think it's going to reorganize itself with files. I read uh, Stevenson's book, Diamond Age. He explains it very well there, and I think that actually is the way of the future. But I may not have answered the question exactly, but it led me to think that thought, and I, maybe that's helpful. Now, Mr. Casey, I have a question. You talked about getting our money out of the country, and I assume that's difficult for someone like myself. Uh, would there be a way to get your wealth out of the country, but not in cash, but rather in buying property abroad? Yes, uh, that is the, incidentally, that's a good point. That's the one form of foreign wealth that as of the moment, I'm sure they're going to change this when we get an asset tax, but you can buy a piece of property anywhere in the world and wire the money to the seller, or don't do that, wire it to a trusted lawyer and have him handle it from there, uh, get title to it, and that is non-reportable, and they can't make you repatriate that piece of real estate. There's much more I could say about this, but yes. And a brief commercial. This is why, a good part of the reason why, uh, I've been to 175 countries, I've lived in 10 or maybe 12, depending on how we want to define live. But uh, I wound up in Argentina, and we set up a place down there, which is kind of upmarket. The entrance fee is 200 grand or more for a lot, and then you've got to build a house. But it's probably the best damn place in the world at any price when it comes to amenities and facilities. Because you know what? I don't want to live like a refugee. Uh, I want to have a Gold's class gym. I want to have a lap pool. I want to have a polo field. I want to have tennis courts and, and, and I could go on for an hour, but we've done this already. So that's where I hang out most of the time, because I like it. And Argentina is a really screwed up country, but this isn't a lecture about Argentina, but you know, it's what you hear about Cristina in, Bu in Buenos Aires is all true, and it's worse than that. But when you're out in the provinces, those provinces are run by warlords. It's true. They're different countries, and it doesn't have to bother you. So, you know, that's one crib I have. I have another one in, in New Zealand and other places. But, uh, yes, real estate is the best thing to do. The second good thing to do is every time you go abroad, and you should go abroad a lot, a lot Take some gold coins with you. Now, whether it can be more or less than $10,000, this is an iffy area. And 
I don't want to get any, give anybody legal advice, but uh, always bring some gold coins and put them in a safe deposit box in the right country. It's not the it's not England, incidentally, uh, or many other countries in Europe. But uh, that's what you should be doing. That's the best practical advice: buy foreign real estate and have gold coins in a foreign safe deposit box. Neither of them are reportable. Both of them are intelligent and practical. Because although there are no bargains in the financial world today that I'm familiar with, uh, those are some real estate in foreign countries. Jeff Berwick, over here at TDV, is doing a similar thing to what we're doing in Argentina, but with a much lower price break point. I would definitely talk to him about that too. It sounds excellent to me. I, would, I could have saved myself a lot of brain damage by just buying something at his place instead of building my own. But, you know, that's water under over the, over the dam. So, um, that's what I, I would do. I was going to ask, uh, along those lines, uh, so you've traveled the world. Why did you pick Argentina? Do you think it has good future prospects? Is it really uh, a good plan B kind of place if you had to pick one? Well, to add to what I said about Argentina, once you're outside of BA, and I do love BA, incidentally, and I spent a lot of time there. Uh, look... It was a process of elimination for me, because I've been almost everywhere, uh, and spent a lot of time almost everywhere. A process of elimination. I looked at Africa. If I was 30, and I wanted to make a killing, I'd go to Africa. I would definitely, there's a huge opportunity there. Huge opportunity, just by the fact that you got more money, different experience, different, that, that's a great place to make money right now and will be for years to come. But I don't want to live in Africa. It's, it's too backward. There's too many problems. All those countries are completely artificial constructs. I ruled that out. I ruled out Europe, because that's going to be on the front line of World War III, whatever shape it takes. Uh, I looked at all the countries in South America. It came for me. If I was going to go to South America, Colombia's coming up. Chile is excellent. That's by far the best country in South America, actually. Uruguay, eh, spent a lot of time in Uruguay. Anyway, for me, it came down to basically the Orient, which is really where the future is going to be. I like Thailand for lots of reasons. It was the only country that wasn't conquered by the Western barbarians. It's mellow. The problem with Thailand, which would be my choice in the Orient, is that if you're not a Thai, you might be a welcome guest, but you're never going to be part of that society. I don't care if you marry a Thai. Forget about it. Pleasant, wonderful, like it, was my second choice. Oddly enough, I came to Argentina, which is, oddly enough, completely the antipodes from Thailand. The opposite end of the world. There are no similarities in culture or anything. It's funny, I chose two polar opposites. I chose Argentina, not because the government isn't crazy, but the government's been crazy down there, and I mean literally crazy, since the 1940s. Uh, but it's an immigrant country. It's more European than Europe which is a plus. Uh, there's a lot of liber libertarian anarchist thinking down there, believe it or not. It's the most sophisticated country in South America. If you like down at the heels elegance, I happen to like that. I like the wide open spaces. So anyway, it's an arbitrary choice in many ways. But you didn't choose Chile even though? Chile is a fantastic choice. Uh, I didn't choose Chile. I spent a lot of time in Chile, but I didn't choose it... Uh, because at least when I was thinking about this, it was always kind of like a backward mining province that could be Argentina but had no class, frankly. <laughs> Beautiful coastline and everything. It's like an island. Chile's actually not, it's, it's like a, an island because it's separated by the Andes from the, and the desert from the rest of the continent. So it's very different. And actually since Pinochet, who's got a not that he was a good guy, but he turned the country around in a favorable way, and they haven't screwed it up too bad. Lad. Chile is an excellent choice, fantastic choice. It's not the cultural mecca that Argentina is. It doesn't have even the libertarian movement that Argentina does, incidentally. It doesn't have the sophistication. Chile might be the best choice, actually, at this point, but I like Argentina. Anyway, nothing goes on forever, and... Uh, I hope against hope after Christina blows up and we have another runaway inflation down there. Who knows? They, all they, have, they don't have to get somebody that's intelligent or good. They have to just get somebody that's 
not an active criminal. That's not asking much. <laughs> so, anyway, you know, uh, I've cast the die. I like it. I enjoy it. Come and look at both countries. Uh, and for practical purposes, this is the only two in Latin America that I think really... I mean, all of them are okay, frankly. They're all okay. But those are, those are actually my two favorite uh, places. Yeah, I was going to ask about Central America if you had uh, explored that. Well, you probably have since you've been in almost a Yeah, time. sure. I, I spent a lot of time in Central America. I was going to Costa Rica in the 70s when... Um, I'll tell you the problem with Central America. It doesn't have any class. Uh, it's the home of what I call the Central American American. And this is a, a rather large group of guys, kind of down on their luck, down on their heels, 40s or 50s, they like to drink beers. They can get young girls that they have somewhat more money than the peasant girls do. And it's full of the, those are the typical American expatriates down there. Uh, Costa Rica has always been the best of the bunch. I'm not sure it is anymore. But it's completely overrun by these kind of gringos. And Panama, that's okay. But they're all okay. Even Guatemala, which, you know, finished a really nasty decades-long civil war ten years ago is okay. But um, I could tell you stories about all of them, uh, you know. But uh, they're okay. They're fine. I mean, uh, Berwick lives in Acapulco, which is supposed to be the fourth most dangerous city in the world, according to Foreign Policy magazine. But, you know, it just depends on where you fit in. They're all okay. I'm just telling you what I like personally. Sir. Mr. Casey, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, if you would choose a place to invest in physical home overseas, where would you invest and how would you invest? As well as, if you had absolute choice only between Australia and New Zealand, which one would you choose? Between Australia and New Zealand? Yes, sir. Oh, I've chosen New Zealand, and I think it was a good choice. Uh, yes, New Zealand is nice because it's, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, I talked with uh, one of my best friends who's a Kiwi, and he pointed out to me that Australia's got, was populated by criminals, and New Zealand was populated by serfs. And he's right. Uh, New Zealand is actually a much mellower place uh, than Australia. It's kind of like a backward little island, unless you go to Tasmania in Australia, which is even more backward than New Zealand. I mean, I first went to New Zealand uh, when they used to roll up the sidewalks in Auckland at 6 o'clock, and I kid you not. But uh, now it's, you know, it's quite advanced technologically. Everything works. It's mellow. There's no racial problem except to some degree with the uh, South Pacific Islanders and the Maoris who have been totally corrupted by the welfare system down there. It's just a real shame. But that's not much. That's not really a problem. Uh, I like New Zealand a lot, uh, actually. And since uh, the interesting thing about New Zealand was in, uh, it was uh, along with Uruguay and um, Sweden, all about the turn of the 19th century, uh, there were, those were the first three socialist countries in the world, overtly. And in New Zealand especially, they ran that place until the wheels fell off. And by the mid-80s, anybody with uh, a half a brain that worked and airfare to get to Sydney, Los Angeles, or the UK got on a plane. It was becoming the shallow end of the gene pool. And uh, now, since Roger Douglas, who incidentally uh, was a socialist, but not a person of bad will, just misdirected, but he had common sense, turn it around. It's gotten much better. It's okay. But, uh, you know, all these Anglo-Saxon countries are pretty much under the thumb of the U.S. So, um, not a bad choice. I still got a place there. I still like it. I actually went there for the polo. Uh, you know, it's a joke I tell. Nobody understands it. People ask me, well, why'd you come to New Zealand? They all look at me funny. And I tell them, for the kangaroos. <laughs> okay. There's no kangaroos here. I say, yeah, I was misinformed. <laughs> it's not a bad choice. It's okay. But uh, Australia is turning into a police state, just like the U.S. is. Much more than New Zealand. Okay, 6 o'clock. Huh? 
Oh, how to invest in gold? First national bullion or Liberty Coin. Bullion. Well, I, I guess. Look, I'm a share. I'm a shareholder in both Hard Assets Alliance and GoldMoney.com. They're both excellent, but that's not physical gold. But they're very good, both of them. Uh, for physical gold, I think in Europe, Switzerland is by far the best answer still, even though Switzerland is not what it used to be. Believe me, it's not. Uh, in South America, I don't know about Chile, but Uruguay is okay. It's okay still. To, you don't keep gold in Argentina in a safe deposit box. That's a mistake. Uh, okay, so we're talking South America, Uruguay probably. Europe, Switzerland. The Orient, Singapore. No question, Singapore. That's your best choice in the world, Singapore. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> what I do is say something and let those who have ears hear, as it were. But um, getting back to Pareto's law, my interpretation of one aspect of it is that 80% of human beings are basically decent, social, get-along, go-along, people of goodwill. I'd say 80%, according to Pareto's law. What about the other 20%? That other 20% are what you might call potential trouble sources. They can blow either way in the wind, depending on how they read the situation. They're kind of amoral, not immoral. The real problem, that's bad, but the real problem is when you get down to the 20% of that 20%, now you're dealing with people with criminal personalities, people that are basically of bad will, and you can take it further, 20% of the 20% of the 20%. Now here's the problem that we're confronting right now in the U.S. It's that those of you who are you're all libertarians, you're all anarchists. We're on the other side of that bell-shaped curve, the other 20% on the other side. Tiny little, little tail on the other side, opposite from these people. But here's the problem. All systems, I don't care what system you're looking at, I don't care what organization or company or whatever group you're looking at, they all degrade over time. They all lose their focus. They all go downhill. It's, it's the second law of thermodynamics. It's entropy. It's just the way things work. Uh, it's why empires rise and they always fall. Now, here's the problem that we're confronting right now in this country, and I'm afraid in the world as a whole, because this is happening all over the world. It's not just here in the U.S. The problem is this. People, actually, the state is in the ascendant all over the world, but especially here in the United States. Everybody is thinking politically. Everybody is thinking the government should do this, the government should do that, the government should change things. Everybody, even people basically that are in the 80% of goodwill, decent human beings. So the state, both from a, a psychological point of view, has insinuated itself throughout the entire society. It's the centerpiece of society. And what is this doing? And, and, and of course, in the laws, and most people believe they should obey the law. I, I mean, to me, most laws are frauds. Uh, there are only two laws, as far as I'm concerned. Do all that you say that you're going to do, and don't aggress against other people or their property. That's the whole of the law. I can live with a law like that. But the solution is to pass more laws, and that's exactly what the sociopaths are doing. Now, why is it going to get worse from here? If you trace the history of the United States, it started going downhill right from the founding thought. The first thing they did in the 1790s, first important law they passed, was the Alien and Sedition Acts. That was overturned, but then you watch the history of the U.S. It was a, it was a model to the world. Incidentally, like America is not a place. America is an idea. Keep that in your mind. It's not a piece of geography, it's an idea. And it was unique in the world's history, actually. But it started going downhill with wars, the Civil War, World War I, foreign adventures. 
And it's like anything that goes downhill. Starts slowly, gets faster and faster and faster. You present your point of view and you listen to the other persons and you respond to it. That's all I was doing. But this guy who runs the Ayn Rand Institute or something like that, he just went wild. And he, it's like he became a lifelong enemy of mine because I was like a heretic, which is further proof that that's just a religion. Anyway, the, uh, that kind of leads me to talking about uh, philosophy. And I, I know this is Stefan's big thing. But to me, talking about philosophy is a little bit pointless. Nobody really cares about philosophy in general, but they do care about the two areas of practical and applied philosophy. Now, what might those be? Well, they're the two things you're never supposed to talk about in public. Religion and politics. That's, those are the practical and applied areas of philosophy. So people talk about philosophy in general, but they'll never talk about philosophy in particular. I, when I'm in the U.S., which is less and less these days, I generally live in Aspen, Colorado, which is a very interesting subculture of a town. And I used to get invited to parties there. I never get invited to parties there anymore because after talking about the weather and the state of the roads and baseball scores, that's good for five minutes. Now what are you going to talk about? Well, I like to talk about important things. I like to talk about philosophy. Practical applied philosophy. What is that? That's religion and politics. The two things you're never supposed to talk about in polite company. So this is why I'm rapidly becoming an ex aspenite at this point, because I can't talk to anybody there. It's one of the nice things about groups like this. So, politics. Uh, I first, it first started seeping into my brain that it was pointless trying to make any political changes in this country when in 1980, when my second book, Crisis Investing, was number one on the list. And of course, in those days, some of you will remember, Phil Donahue's show was as big or bigger than Oprah was until recently. So I had the singular good luck to be on Donahue's show all by myself for an hour the day before the national elections when Carter and Reagan were running against each other. So, Phil's a very smart guy, and we were talking, and the elections were the very next day, and this was live, and so he, uh, I said something unkind about Carter and whatever, and he said, oh, then you're voting for Mr. Reagan, and I said something even more unkind about Reagan, because re Republicans are more dangerous than the Democrats. They're more dangerous because they, on the surface, sound like free market people. Well, they're not, of course. Uh, they definitely don't believe in social freedom, and they say they believe in, in economic freedom, which gives people, turns people off. Well, at least the Democrats, I've got to say, at least they're, they actually do have a core philosophy, and they actually do believe in collectivism. The Republicans do, too. They just don't, they aren't honest enough to come out and say it. They're hypocrites. I hate hypocrites. Anyway, so after I said something unkind about Reagan, Phil said, ah, then you must be a libertarian. You're voting for whoever the libertarian candidate was. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. In 1980. And at that point, the audience, like the mob they were, were going back and forth, liking what I said, hating it, back and forth. They really disliked it when I told them, even back then, that it's the worst allocation of time and money you can possibly make sending your kids to be corrupted by going off to college. They really didn't like that. But I'll tell you what they liked even less. They liked, clearly, it's one of those maybe dozen things in my intellectual development that are burned like a diamond in my forehead. I read the first book, of the, of the first page of A Virtue of Selfishness, and I had to put it down. I said, I can't believe Somebody has actually crystallized everything that I've always intuitively believed, but had not been able to formulate. So at that point, shamefully, I became a Randite, uh, because it made so much sense. But then, the next evolution was 
when I was in my 20s and I went on a treasure hunting expedition, uh, a real one, with a big boat and everything, for three months. And one of the books I brought along with me was a book called The Market for Liberty. It's written by the Tannehills, more, mostly Morris, I guess. And uh, uh, it was a defense of anarchism, but never once in that book did they use the word anarchy, which is one reason why it was probably such an effective defense. It explained how an anarchic society would work. But here's an interesting thing. Only 500 copies of that book were printed. It was like a samizdat. But later on, the, the boat sank and my book went down with it and so forth. But then, in 1979, I wrote a book called Crisis Investing. And it was number one on the New York Times list for 19 weeks. And I did all these television shows and so forth. And so, I think it was Andrea Rich got in touch with me because I'd been promoting the book in the, in the bibliography of my book and I got hundreds of calls and letters. Where can I get this book market for liberty? And uh, so they asked me to write the foreword for the book and they asked Carl Hess, uh, who many of you probably know who he is, to write the introduction for it. So it was kind of like a back to the future kind of thing where I got to write a foreword for the book that changed my life, which is kind of not usually the way it works. But that wasn't good enough to become an anarchist, in my opinion. My next step was to become a Discordian. And a lot of you here will know what a Discordian is. Uh, I can sum up Discordian philosophy for you very briefly. And it's this, the whole of the law shall be do as thou wilt, but be prepared to accept the consequences. So that's where I am. I've taken a step from growing up in a cannibalistic death cult, Catholicism, <laughs> to thinking I was a conservative and then thinking I was a Randite and even anarchism isn't good enough. So that's where I am right now. It's a funny thing though, because I met Ayn Rand uh, just a few months before she died, actually, I was invited to a party uh, <clears throat> where she was the featured, um, she was the guest of honor, obviously. And uh, I found her charming, warm, very much unlike uh, the way I guess she really is, or was. <laughs> uh, but after, after the party, I went out with about a dozen of her acolytes, and uh, it turned into a uh, it turned into a real clusterfuck because uh, I was already a Discordian and these people were clearly co-religionists where anything that, was, that Rand said was dogma. So we didn't get along very well. And it's very interesting about the Randites. It's that uh, it really is a secular religion, much like Marxism. It's funny, I was on a a radio show with some guy named Yaron Brook. I remember his name because, once again, I don't argue with people. It's pointless to have arguments with people. False pretenses from a government agency. And I'd like you to identify yourself now. Save yourself some embarrassment. So. Stand up, no harm done, but just let everybody know. Come on. Ah, this is very interesting, because once again I was watching the audience, and some of you were looking around to see who the person was. Those of you who weren't looking around are suspect. <laughs> but nobody stood up. I. Uh, I first uh, tried that coup when I was at a, uh, a rather, uh, rather sketchy, rather iffy tax haven conference in the Cayman Islands some years ago. And I actually said that, and not one, but two people stood up. And I'm, not, I, I'm not kidding you. And I've, I've used it occasionally since then, but uh, government agents usually do have to identify themselves. So I'm, I'm gratified to see it, but I'm disappointed in the uh, Black Riders of Mordor. So what I want to do uh, is tell you how 
I became a libertarian, partially. Uh, I want to tell you where I think the society is going to go over the next few years. And uh, maybe tomorrow I'll tell you what I think you ought to do about it. But let me just start out. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you my uh, political pilgrim's progress. I remember, I remember this very distinctly. When you look back into your early childhood and see what you can remember and what you can't remember, one of the first things that I can remember was when I was about seven years old. And I grew up uh, in Chicago. And uh, for some reason, my mother took me someplace in Chicago through a, a bad area. A lot, of, a lot of black people living in slums. And being a suburban kid, I was kind of shocked. I thought it was terrible that these people were, were living in dumps. And you know what I said to my mother? I said, this isn't right. I'm a seven-year-old kid. I was a precocious seven-year-old kid. But I said, isn't there something that you can do, uh, do about it? And she didn't quite say, well, write your congressman. But uh, I got the idea that I ought to write a letter to President Eisenhower. And my mother took down what I said, and she typed it up, and she sent a letter to Eisenhower. And I knew even then, at seven years old, that there was something wrong with what I asked her to do. But she did it. Now, I don't have any political memory from there until I'm in high school. In between there, that time, when I was seven, and wrote a letter to Eisenhower, and when I was in high school, I don't remember much about my political evolution. I, I only know that I never liked authority. And I always felt when somebody asked me, hey, you got a problem with authority, my answer would always be something like, no. I just don't like people telling me what to do. And that's, that's about the extent of my evolution at that, at that point. But it, it went beyond that. The first thing that really happened to me was when I was in high school, and I read Barry Goldwater's book, Conscience of a Conservative. A lot of the things in there made sense, and I figured I must be a conservative. And then my next step after that was after I got out of college, for well, the last year I was in college, I read Ayn Rand's Virtue of Selfishness. And I remember that even less when I gave them, I started to give them the five reasons why I wasn't voting for the Libertarian the next day, and why, they, why the mob shouldn't vote at all. So there, the eyes of the audience widened on me. I could see this because I was watching them. And um, I started to give them the five reasons you shouldn't vote. I started out with saying, first, it's immoral because the whole political system is corrupt, it's based upon force and coercion, and it's immoral for you to participate in it. Well, no reaction really, because they're not used to hearing the word morality used from somebody that's not wearing a, a black suit with one of those little collars. Then I got to the second point that I was going to make. It's that it just gets your name into another government computer bank. They, you're identifying yourself further to the government. The third reason I gave them was that it just encourages them. Nobody with any sense is actually voting for one of these jerks. They're voting against the other guy. But the guy they wind up voting for thinks it's actually a vote for him. So it just encourages them and it keeps the system going. The audience is getting rested. I got to the fourth reason was it's degrading to you as a human being, to stand around a government office, to identify yourself, to vote, to hang around the kind of people that do this type of thing. And I could not get to the fifth and most important reason that you shouldn't vote, which is your vote doesn't count. It counts about as much as a grain of sand on the beach. And I didn't even get from there to saying, anyway, it's not who votes that counts. It's like Stalin correctly uh, observed. It's who counts the votes. And this was in Chicago, where Donahue did that. They could have understood that. <laughs> so, anyway, this kind of led me to the psychology of Bubis Americanus, to the, the unwashed mob out there. I mean, I remember one guy in this audience when I was making a, on the Donahue show, when I was making a comment about taxes and theft and all this type of thing, some observation, 
And I swear this is the truth. You can find the tape. I don't even have the tape of it anymore. It's too bad because it was one of my best performances ever. And I said, and the guy says, raises his hand, and he says, well, why doesn't the government pay for these things? I mean, that is the level of thinking politically. So trying to change things in this country is totally impossible. If somebody can ask a question like that, why doesn't the government pay for it? When I said taxpayers are paying for it, uh, it's, it's completely pointless. It's a complete waste of time, and you're kidding yourself looking for political change. But this kind of led me over the years to think about the psychology of the average chimpanzee out there. And I'm a believer in the fact that Pareto's law is a correct analysis of uh, reality. Now you all know Pareto's law, it's the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of your salesmen make 80% of the sales. 20% of the population commits 80% of the crimes. It's a normal bell-shaped curve. And I've come to the conclusion that libertarianism, God forbid anarchism, uh, God forbid discordianism, is actually a genetic mutation. And it's very hard to change a genetic mutation. It is part of your being. This is not to say that it's a waste of time to try to explain. Don't try to convince. That's pointless. Then you get into an argument with people. And when you're in an argument with people, they feel like they've got to win. So you're not going to get anywhere. The most that 